Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday, January 20th, uh, Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting. I will call to order the meeting at 6.30 p.m. Before we get to roll call, we have introduction of new members and alternates. And with uh, the recent elections and appointments, we have a few. Um, City of Aurora has, um, has uh, Council Member Coombs. She was the alternate prior to this meeting. And Mayor Kaufman is now the alternate, and he was the member prior to this meeting. <clears throat> Boulder County, we have Commissioner Levy uh, taking the place of Commissioner Jones. Welcome. Um, we, we also have, um, for Douglas County, uh, Commissioner Teal. He was with us previously as, as a council member from the um, town of uh, Castle Rock, and uh, we welcome him. Um, uh, his, his alternate is Commissioner Abe Layden from Douglas County. Um, and with that, uh, Mayor Jason Gray from the town of Castle Rock is now assuming the, uh, the board member's seat for the town of Castle Rock. He was the alternate prior. And we have Council Member Dietz uh, being uh, Mayor Gray's alternate. Um, from, <clears throat> excuse me, the town of Lock Bowie, we have um, um, Council Member Kremerly, and um, his alternate is uh, Council Member Jeffrey, uh, Jamie Jeffrey. So thank, thank you very much for that. Um, the town of Superior, we have Council Member Neil Shaw as the member, and we also have the alternate, uh, Council Member Tim Howard. Uh, welcome both. And uh, Jefferson County, we have Commissioner Tracy Kraft Tharp, and the alternate for Jefferson County is Commissioner Andy Kerr. And uh, we have a, a new alternate for the city of Louisville, uh, Council Member Kyle Brown. And with that, that concludes um, the new members. Uh, and so Ms. Stevens, please uh, roll call. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And uh, for our new members, uh, I will be calling out the member's name. And if your member is not present, then I will be calling out the alternate. Otherwise, alternates will not be announced. So just want to give everyone a heads up. So, all right, here we go. So first is Aaron Brockett. Present. Adam Cushing. Present. Adam Zarin. Allison Coombs. Present. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Bill Giff. Present. Bill Van Meter. Okay, I do see that Bill is in attendance, uh, but maybe he's having technical difficulties. All uh, right. Present. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Bob Pfeiffer. John Marriott. Bud Starker. Okay, I do see that Bud is in attendance. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Bud. Uh, Claire Levi or Levy? I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's Levy. I'm here. Thank you, Claire Levy. Um, Colleen Whitlow. Uh, she did email me and tell me she was having technical difficulties, but are you there, Colleen? Okay, uh, but she is in attendance. Uh, David Spellman. Deborah Mulvey. Present. Don Cognac. David Whelan. Eva Henry. Steve Odericio. George Lance. Dave Kerber. George Teal. Abe Layden, Herb Atkinson. Yes. Thank you, Herb. Jacob LeBuer. Jim Dale. Okay, I do Here. see the There we go. Thank you, Jim. Uh, James Kumerly. Jamie Jeffrey. Jason Gray. Here. Jeff Baker. Here. Jeremy Fay. Jessica Sandgren. Here. Joan Peck. 
Here. Josie Cockerell. Okay, I do see that Josie is in attendance. Maybe she's having technical difficulties. Uh, Julie Duran Mullica. Joyce Downing. Karina Elrod. Here. Catherine Whitman. Jackie Thomas. Kevin Flynn. Here. Christopher Larson. Larry Vidham. Here. Linda Montoya. Celeste Arner. Linda Olson. Here. Lynette Kelsey. Here. Margot Ramson. Mike Hillman. Neil Shaw. Here. Nicholas Angelo. Holly Rogan. Nicholas Williams. Here. Nicole Frank. Present. Paul Sutton. Sean Foray. Rachel Binkley. Ryan Toucher. Randy Wheel. Here. Randy Wheelock. George Marlin. Rebecca White. Here. Ron Angle. Roy Palmer. Sally Daigle. Present. Huh? Stephanie Walton. Tim Barnes. Steve Conklin. Uh, I do see Steve in attendance. May be having issues at this. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Tammy Mauer. Present. Thank you. Tracy Kraft Tharp. Uh, and again, I do see her in attendance. Uh, William Lindstedt. Here. And Winshaw. Here. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And with that, we do have a quorum, and I will hand it back to our chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Uh, the next item, uh, approval of the agenda. Uh, do we have a motion out there to approve the agenda? So uh, move. I, I heard you know, Director Atchison. Um, I need a second. Yes. Second. Yep. Second. Right. I, I heard a second as well. I, I, I can't um, decipher who, who's second. always still. Second. Very good. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, first vote of the night, people. All in, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. We do have an agenda. Thank you, everyone. The next item is report of the chair. Uh, the report on performance and engagement committee. I will turn it over to Director Flynn. Director Flynn, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the uh, P&E committee uh, earlier this month, we discussed several approaches that staff took to revitalizing or re-engaging in with our annual award celebration. We had, as you may recall, a reservation at Mile High Stadium for April, I believe it was April 28th. Uh, that does not look feasible uh, under the current circumstances. And in addition, we had to confirm that by a point next month that we weren't certain we could meet. So the staff has recommended several virtual options and the one that uh, that the committee uh, settled on was to uh, accept the staff recommendation to conduct a virtual event, a sort of a scaled back, uh, recognizing potential budget constraints. Uh, we uh, are talking about making guest attendance free or re as reasonable as possible, still pursuing paid sponsorships. Uh, we did have a discussion 
uh, also on the committee about having an in-person event later in the fall this year. Uh, but the members, after thoroughly talking that through, uh, decided that we should try to stick with our spring event and simply uh, prepare for an in-person event and a uh, better celebration in spring of 22. And so that is the report, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, the next report is report on Finance and Budget Committee. Director Conklin, please. Good evening, thank you very much. We've just had two items tonight uh, to discuss. One of them uh, we approved allowing the Executive Director to enter into an agreement with the Federal Trans Transit Administration, FTA, for approximately $2 million uh, for a period of October 1st, 2020 through September 30th of 2021. That's an item we had actually talked about and approved previously, but it was something that we needed to get some specific language in the resolution. So we acted on that and took care of that this evening. We also approved authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with RTD, the Regional Transportation District, uh, in support of van pool services offered by Dr. Cog's Way to Go program in an amount not to exceed $468,000 with the term ending December 31st of 2021. And that's my report. Thank you, Director Conklin. Uh, the next item, report of the executive director. Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everyone. Uh, first, just want to give you a quick update on COVID operations at Dr. Cog. Uh, mandatory telework is still in effect for our staff, although I anticipate opening up the office back up in February timeframe for in a voluntary phase. We were in a voluntary phase before the, the last, uh, last spike, um, so hopefully we'll get to a point um, sometime in early February where we can offer it back up for in a voluntary phase. Um, as, as many of you know, our AAA staff, they're on the healthcare front lines providing needed services to our older adults. And as such, they're, they're beginning to receive their vaccines. Um, it will be a personal comfort to me once we were able to get everyone vaccinated. So we're, that's, that's great news. We're, uh, we're, uh, you know, in that, in that, um, one B phase, one B slot that, um, that allows our, our, uh, AAA staff that are out in the field to be able to get those vaccinations. And speaking of vaccinations, um, we have been in contact with with a couple healthcare systems to see where we may be able to to assist with getting older adults to the vaccination sites. As you know, transportation is always a barrier for our, our older adults, and we are working with the state to try to find some solutions. Uh, Dr. Cog is continuing a long-standing relationship we have with World Denver. It's a nonprofit that connects. The world to Colorado and the Colorado to the world through cross-cultural exchanges. Um, as with nearly all aspects of lives right now, COVID has changed their model and rather than hosting a group of fellows at our offices, we'll be conducting a virtual learning event tomorrow with 15 Latin American entrepreneurs that are currently completing fellowships uh, with Colorado-based companies. We'll, we'll be sharing what makes the Denver region unique and, and how we work together to become the best version of our collective self. Director Flynn gave a great summary of the conversations that were had at Performance and Engagement Committee earlier this month about the award celebration. Um, our communication staff is now planning all the details for that virtual event to be hosted in, in April. Um, and it promises to be a very meaningful, entertaining virtual event. We're, we're excited about the opportunity to do it this way. Um, it's unfortunate, of course, we have to do it virtually, but I think we're gonna make the most out of a, out of a very difficult situation. So there's more details will come on this, but. Please plan on joining us as we celebrate the people, projects, and plans that are really moving our region forward. I also wanted to give you just a quick heads up for now on, um, on our Citizens Academy. Applications for our Spring Citizens Academy will open up around February 1st or so. The Academy runs for seven weeks on Tuesday evenings. And of course, we're also conducting those virtually right now. Um, and this is really a great opportunity for anyone interested in learning about regional issues and and uh, how to become more involved. So I would ask our board members just to be on the lookout for anyone in your communities that may be a good candidate for this, for this program. Um, we would love to entertain their applications. Uh, so the next item I want to talk to you about is um, our performance and engagement and finance and budget committees. Um, uh, this, every year we do a solicitation um, seeking interest for, for members, uh, 
our board members to serve on either the performance and engagement committee or the finance and budget committee. Um, we're planning on sending an email out tomorrow soliciting your interest in either one of those two, two board committees. The email will include some information um, about the committees themselves and its current memberships. Um, board members who have been around a little bit um, will recall that, the, um, that your membership on either one of those committees is uh, for a two-year term. So those members whose terms are expiring um, uh, this year will need to resubmit their interest. We'll, uh, um, well, we, Melinda, will, <laughs> will be reaching out to those members to make sure they're aware of that. And, and um, we look forward to, uh, to your interest in those committees. So the, the, uh, the plan right now is um, that those, the new members will be, of those committees will be seated at the February board meeting on the recommendation of the nominating committee. So stay tuned for that. Um, I also wanted to make note, because it's, it's pretty unusual for us, that we have a number of very noteworthy items in the information items section of your packet this evening. Um, that information items a section for, for our new board members are ones just really, there's no briefing on, on those particular items. It's just in your packet for your review and consideration. Um, uh, the reason I wanted to mention, because there are several of those information items that are in your packet that will be coming back to the board next month for action. Um, for example, um, the amendment to the Articles of Association, we are, in, um, Jenny Dock, our, our finance director, when we approved our, our uh, 2021 budget back in November, she mentioned to the board that we've had conversations with the Finance and Budget Committee about changing our fiscal year from calendar year to the state fiscal year beginning on July 1st. So um, we anticipate bringing that item to you for action next month, but we wanted to show you what the red line version of that looks like. And it's, it's a pretty, it's a, pretty minimal change to our articles, but it's an important uh, change. So we want to make sure you saw that before you actually voted on that next month. Also, the nominating committee has made its recommendations for the board officers for 2021, and that will also be voted on at next month's board meeting. So that's uh, contained in your packet for your information. Uh, we also have in there our draft 2021 federal and state legislative issues. Uh, its staff has made some, some marginal changes to, to uh, both of those documents. So please review those, the, the red line versions that are included in your packet. And again, um, if you have any comments or would like um, to include any additional language in there related to specific items, um, please let staff know by the dates specified in the memo. And um, we'll be sure to add that to the, uh, to the version that will be um, included in the February packet for action by the board. Last but not least, um, I just wanted to mention the RTD Accountability Committee, Committee preliminary report is included in the information items as well. Dr. Cog um, staff is providing, we're providing staff support to that committee um, and the committee elected to submit an optional mid-year report to the, the, uh, the partners of um, uh, that created the accountability committee, and that is um, RTD board, uh, the, the governor, as well as the transportation chairs in the legislature. Uh, the report highlights activities of the committee to date, uh, future areas of exploration, and also has some legislative recommendations for consideration during the upcoming legislative session. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention today's inauguration um, I'm sure many of you are able to witness this great American tradition. And as someone myself, who's recently uh, recently became a citizen of this country, it had a special meaning for me. But with all new administrations, uh, with all new administrations, today marks a new beginning. So let's keep all of our na national leaders in our uh, thoughts and prayers as we move forward. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that is my report. Thank you, sir. Executive Director Rex, thank you so much for your report and your parting words. We appreciate that. Uh, the next item is public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Ms. Stevens, is there anybody who would like to uh, make public comment, please? 
All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, what I'm gonna do is open up the phone lines and make sure there isn't anyone just solely on the phones. Uh, so if you are on the phones for public comment, uh, please hit star six now and state your name for the record. Okay, um, I am not hearing anyone on the phones, but we did have someone write in for public comment. Um, so our, for, our first uh, public comment will come from Jamie Helt. Uh, Jamie, you will have three minutes and at three minutes, I will ask you to make your closing statement and you have the floor. Hi. Jamie, the first speaker was supposed to be Ian. I do not see him on the line. I did notice that you guys asked a specific order, but I do not see him. Okay, um, then can you have Mo speak next? After you? No, Mo oh. first and then, and then I'll speak. Sorry about that. Nope, no problem. Okay, then we will skip Jamie for now and we will uh, call on Mo. Mo, unfortunately, I do not know how to pronounce your last name. So if you will state it for the record, I would appreciate it. Uh, and you should be able to speak now. No problem. I can hear you fine. Uh, my name's Mo Natic. The H is silent. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, no problem. Um, yeah, so thank, thank you guys for uh, for taking the public comments right now. Uh, obviously I had sent you a list of a few of us that are gonna, are gonna speak um, because what we kind of wanna bring to the attention and garner some feedback from everyone is the current crisis surrounding the unhoused neighbor community. Um, all of us are residents in Denver. So a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today are kind of Denver specific, um, but these are issues that are affecting multiple cities across the state and truly across the nation. Um, there's a lot of things that are being showed up in the news of all these sweeps that are happening, um, sweeping of the homeless encampments. Um, we've actually, there was a report that came in just last week that uh, Denver spent over $400,000 on these, on sweeping these encampments, um, which do things like uh, hazmat and waste management, but from actually several members of our team that go out and do community work, it's, it's really not a, a foolproof process there was actually a 300 person encampment called Arkins Court that the city left over a ton of trash in addition to dozens of um, exposed needles. And that we actually had a, a team of harm reduction crew come in and, and sweep that. Um, so something that we wanna talk about is how do we mitigate this? And all of us that are gonna to speak today come from event production backgrounds. Um, myself, uh, I was an associate producer of an event that was held in Loveland County from 2013 to 2019. It's the largest multi-genre camping festival in the state of Colorado with about 15,000 souls on site. Um, this was a, a music festival that grew about 30% each year since the time I joined the company. So part of my purpose was facilitating operations. Um, putting out these plans to safely plot out and activate areas and staffing where attendees would call home for three days, creating livable, functioning, safe sites. Um, so we look at the unhoused community and, and what's going on. There's very little that's helping to mitigate it. There's something that's popped up called safe outdoor spaces that can camp about between 20 and 60 residents at any given camp. Um, so it's it's a great undertaking, it's it's passionate. A few of us actually went and went and looked at the sites, um, but we look at the crisis and we look at the number of people, it's really not even putting a dent. So we really are interested in talking about expansion. Uh, we have a lot of great ideas that we're putting into motion, a lot of assets that we would love to connect with anyone um, in regard to how that might look in any city. Um, we talk about putting our teams into action, right? These working with within areas of the city that are you know um just, just running things more efficiently this is this is essentially what we do event producers and event staff in general are seasoned in running these fully functional sites that take into consideration safety medical harm reduction functionalities potable water power without being excessive waste management etc um so it's something that we're very passionate about um this aspect of the creative sector that is currently experiencing unemployment due to COVID and actually being able to put people back to work to help mitigate uh, um, the unhoused community crisis that we're experiencing in Denver and so many surrounding cities. I think that was three minutes. 
Yes, thank you, Ms. Nepiuk. Um, okay, then our, uh, I appreciate your comments. Our next uh, public comment is from Jamie Help. Jamie, you will have three minutes and then I'll ask you to make your closing statement. Thank you. Um, I'm Jamie Heltz. Um, a little bit about my background. I managed the Belco Theater at the Colorado Convention Center, um, and I also ran the largest New Year's Eve festival in North America for five years. This included writing the emergency safety plan that led to increasing the capacity of the festival. Um, I also was involved in all the operations of the festival as well. Um, the creative sector supports nearly 100,000 employees and generates nearly $16 billion in sales in Denver alone. Um, reports generated in July of 2020 suggest that Colorado as a whole lost over 51% of employment and 24% of its annual revenue, and that number has just increased since then. Nationally, over 77% of people in the live events industry have lost their entire income. Um, we've seen nine permanent venues close in Denver um, and 54% of venues nationwide have permanently closed um, as, as well as many festivals um, that were planned to be held have had to move to a virtual setting or be completely canceled. Um, so as Mo kind of touched on, we wanna put these people back to work. Um, the events industry has a unique workforce of people who are trained and experienced um, in a myriad of different um, expertise. This includes operations staff, so the site building, power, and water. Um, we know how to create a space that functions um, well and operate it for a period of time. Um, we also have security and medical staff that are trained in de-escalization, critical incidents, mental health, and trauma counseling. Um, we're trained in waste management, administration, and safety. Um, we also want to turn this program into a work training program and take it as an opportunity to cross-train and provide additional education to event professionals to further prepare them as a resource for any emergency operations need in the future. We'll be sending out a survey to venue professionals to see about integrating their spaces that have been left dormant or have potential of going under, their assets, their employees or former employees that are out of work um, to see if they'd be willing to jump in on a project like this um, now and how much time they'd be willing to give and how they can you know, join this workforce as well as find out what kind of skills they're interested in learning so we can help build these education modules for them. We're event professionals. We create standard operating procedures and training modules and the end goal is to be able to create a model here so that we can step in and fill the need for this safe operation site management that Denver is asking for, but that it will also translate into a model that we can pass along to train industry professionals to be able to step up and take on whatever need comes next. All right, thank you so much for your comments. Okay, our next question or comment will be from uh, Matthew Kowal. Uh, you have three minutes, and at the end of three minutes, I will ask you to make your closing statement. So you have the floor. Thank you so much. Now, Ian uh, Tafoya was gonna start this. If he's ready and has his hand up, would he be able to go next? Um, I'm not seeing him, but uh, we do see that uh, Mo is signed in twice, so is that potentially maybe him as well? Let's check if that's okay. Sure. Uh, Ian, is that you on the line? Am I showing up as Mo? You are. <laughs> oh, well, that would solve a lot of that would solve a lot of these problems. All right. Well, Ian, then I guess you have the floor and you have three minutes, and so you may begin. Well, I certainly appreciate you accommodating us and moving us around. I've been a parliamentarian and you're giving us a lot of grace, so I really appreciate that. Uh, to everyone on the board, my name is Ian Thomas Tafoya. I've come here and testified before. Um, I'm a winner of a Dr. Card, uh, Cog Award for transportation, actually. And I went through the Citizens Academy when it was in the Transit Alliance. And um, I've worked in the Mayor's Office of Denver, the City Council of Denver. And I have had a, a fun and an exciting career, side career working in large events from City Park Jazz, 
to the People's Fair, uh, to the Grand Doozy where I worked on the community engagement team or the Underground Music Showcase, which actually uh, takes place inside the Baker community um, for three days. Um, we're here today to talk about getting creative about the, the solutions for the unhoused and moving as quickly as possible to not only fulfill the human rights of individuals to water and sanitation, but to bring some stability for both our communities who are frustrated about what's happening, uh, not only to the people, uh, but what's also happening to our water quality and the public health risks that we're putting ourselves in. So this group that I have brought together with you today, we're an event professional alliance for safe outdoors camping spaces that we're really hoping we can work with the community to scale. Um, as you heard, we have individuals who've worked on the largest camping festivals in the state of Colorado, the largest indoor festivals, and people who have started, whom you're gonna hear, Mateo, who has bridged this gap from emergency management and planning um, into the events professional world. What we do know is that we've been making progress with the city and county of Denver around this conversation of scaling campsites and, a, and in a real way, putting back people who are uh, currently unemployed back to work, using our skill set and helping the community. When the first testing sites were coming up, including the Pepsi Center, who did they call? They called people like us who have expertise in ticketing, who have expertise in popping up individual cities with the required necessary uh, pieces and doing it in communities all across the metro region you know, all of you have special events, all of us is. We've all put on special events throughout the community and we know how to work with city professionals um, to get this done. We want to help scale and so why are we here? We're here making a pitch to you. This is us uh, saying we're gonna send a deck and, you're, and we want to be resources to help solve this problem for our community once and for all. We have a long history and a legacy of help and of organized camping to solve some of these solutions. Going back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we offer camping sites in some of our outdoor open spaces um, in the community, but only for those who are wealthy or privileged enough to access them. You know, we also have interim solutions we've been testing for the last six uh, months with what we call the headwaters protectors, which is reduced waste shown up and been able to provide service for up to 500 individuals living on eight sprawling blocks in downtown Denver. We clean up hundreds of bags of trash. We've trained more than 150 individuals from Colorado and Denver in particular, uh, but from the metro area actually. We get people from the suburbs who know how to now run emergency water systems, have harm reduction training, and now have built a community and some resiliency training. And so again, this is my pitch to you for us to get creative. Uh, I know how wonderful of an idea uh, Dr. Cog is for this regional planning. This housing crisis is a regional problem. And when I look at Metro Vision 2040, this is a solution from car camping to, to uh, siting for um, using basic built infrastructure that's already there, tapping into electrical, tapping into water. We can train for the future. We can tap into a wide variety of dollars, emergency dollars, climate dollars, homeless dollars, uh, water quality dollars. And so um, I hope you can see our vision and thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Tafoya, for your comment. Um, so I believe our final person for uh, public comment will be Matthew Kowal. Matthew, you have three minutes and you have the floor. Thank you. My name is Matthew Cowell and uh, I work with Majestic Collaborations. Uh, some of you may have worked with my wife, Molly North, was the director of Bike Denver. Um, I was the director of the Tour de Fat Bicycle Musical Festival for New Belgium for about 11 years, about 110 festivals and a million, million attendees, raised $5 million for bicycle advocacy. And after I left there, uh, started recognizing that a lot of the skills that we've been building, um, Ian alluded to it, and uh, what Mo and Jamie have done, are, are building temporary cities. And along with that, um, uh, through since the stage collapses 10 years ago, we've had to do a lot of certifications to understand how to operate outdoor structures and safe power systems, water systems, and waste. And so a lot of these ideas that started three years ago became a lot more um, uh, apparent and salient during corona that uh, cities as we know them could change kind of quickly and folks who have worked in that sort of dynamic area um, such as event producers we're finding ourselves um, having some of those skills that, that we both want to share and develop and so what can we do to make more creative solutions for public health issues and um, uh, what can um, we learn about public health as event producers? So um, we work with, uh, Majestic Collaborations work with arts and venues and the Colorado Creative Industries on a grant um, to found the um, uh, 
uh, Arts and Cultural Network for Emergency Preparedness. We've consulted with FEMA on their guide to expanding mitigation using arts and culture and contributed to the Resilient Music City study with uh, sound diplomacy. I'll share these links in the file um, in the chat, but what I think is gonna be the most useful is a survey we're putting out now that Jamie spoke about. Um, we're working on getting an inventory of event producers and venues that want to be part of resiliency so if you had the idea while we were talking about these unhoused encampments and how to organize those better and then thought well maybe this is also a great way to put vaccination sites on their feet and to get event producers who know how to set the tents and power systems up and also to make sure that the wayfinding is safe and that people feel comfortable um, and manage security in a good way that's exactly right it's those folks in these small towns around the state who put on rodeos and other fourth of july parades that are exactly the sort of folks that you're going to want a good database of and we want to help you uh, catalog those with this um, survey so we'll share it with you and ask for some input to make sure it meets your needs and uh, we'd like to make a coordinated Colorado plan for both uh, um, the encampments of unhoused as well as other sorts of uh, situational emergencies what we're looking at now my color my family came to Colorado during the Dust Bowl to uh, Southern Colorado La Vida and, and Walsenburg is where I'm from and we know that climate may, migration can come fast and come hard and so if we can't take a, a care of the people that are unhoused right now it could get a lot worse a lot quicker with climate change and economic downturn so let's be prepared and work on creative solutions together All right, thank you so much again for your comment. Um, and with that, we do not have any other public comment. Oh, I am so sorry. I do see a hand raise from uh, Director Aaron Brockett. Director Brockett. Yeah, thanks to the speakers for that. Uh, those intriguing ideas. Um, I don't know how much is going to come through the chat. I'm not not seeing anything come through. So I wonder if one of the speakers might give us an email address that we could send something to if we wanted to learn more about their ideas. Um, just a, yes. Matthew at Majestic Collaborations is one, and then that's where you'll find the Art of Mass Gatherings and some of these other symposiums. So we have taught classes before, and uh, it's a good place to take a look and see if there's a symposium like that for a uh, rural or a city uh, that, that would like to do those. Thanks very much. I, yeah. I would just add that we also have an hour or about a 45 minute presentation that runs through all of the pieces, including the economics of what it would cost to pop one of these up. And we do have an email for the staff here at Dr. Cog, and we would gladly share our white paper and our presentation and come to speak to anybody about it. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and at this point, I do not see anyone else for public comment, so I will hand it back to our chair. All right, uh, thank you again, Ms. Stevens. Uh, and again, public comment speakers, uh, please feel free to uh, forward any information on to, to our staff. That way our additional board members can, uh, can access that information um, as they see fit. I, I appreciate your, your comments. Uh, the next item is the consent agenda. We are looking for, uh, for approval of the consent agenda if there are no questions or comments. Um, anybody out there who would like to make a motion to um, approve the consent agenda, um, please. All right, the first hand I saw that went up was from uh, Director Jeff Baker. Uh, Director Baker, go ahead. Yes, I'd like to make an, a motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Director Baker. Do we have a second, Ms. Stevens? Second. This is Tammy Mauer. Great. Director Mauer, thank you so much. Uh, we have a motion from Director Baker, a second from Director Mauer. Uh, I assume we are opening up the, the phone line, so we will call for a vote. All of those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against, abstain. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next section of the agenda is uh, is informational briefings. Uh, item eight: briefing on COVID-19 relief funding and unallocated TIP funding. Mr. Papstorf, please. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board of directors. Um, going to brief a little bit this evening about um, some COVID-19 relief funding that. Um, came to the um, came is coming to the region in addition to some addition some previously unallocated uh, transportation improvement program funding 
talk a little bit about the background on this uh, as well as uh, describe next steps. So I am going to share, this is attachment B in your agenda packet for your reference. So um, uh, I don't often get a chance to quote um, a movie uh, at one of these meetings, but I think um, this quote from Ferris Bueller's Day Off is kind of appropriate. Life moves pretty fast. Um, this item has been, this issue has been moving pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, way, way back on uh, December 21st, 22nd, Congress passed an omnibus appropriations bill. It was signed into law on December 27th. Um, that appropriations bill for fiscal year, federal fiscal year 21, also incorporated a coronavirus um, uh, relief uh, act uh, rolled into that. It's called the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. It rolls right off the tongue. Uh, the really catchy acronym is CRRSAA. Um, I'll refer to it as a COVID relief uh, funding package. Um, it caught a lot of us uh, by surprise. We'd anticipated a lot of components of that uh, COVID relief um, bill, uh, like like transit agent further transit agency um, support. Uh, <laughs> It also included a provision that um, uh, $9.8 billion was allocated in the form of surface transportation block grant um, program funds. Uh, most of you should be familiar with that. It's one of, it's one of the key funding sources um, that uh, Dr. Cog directs to projects and programs uh, in the region through the TIP. Uh, that $9.8 billion was um, apportioned out to states uh, by sort of normal formula. Um, what has changed since just since this memo came out um, just and just within the last uh, day and a half is that the Federal Highway Administration released the formal apportionments. You'll note that in the staff report, um, our original estimates were that of that um, of this of the allocation to the state of Colorado, about one hundred and thirty four million dollars, that um, roughly thirty six million dollars would be sub allocated to Dr. Cog as a large urban area, uh, uh, population over 200,000, um, as consistent with uh, federal transportation authorization law and, and previous appropriations and normal appropriations bills. Um, we found, in, found out in the actual apportionment information uh, that Federal Highway Administration released just yesterday um, that uh, either by accident or by intent, and many of us missed it in several readings of the bill language, uh, the actual ratio used to sub-allocate a portion of that surface transportation block grant uh, money to large urban areas like Dr. Cog, like North Front Range, MPO, like uh, Pikes Peak area, um, that they changed the formula and the ratio slightly. So instead of $36 million to Dr. Cog, uh, we now know through Federal Highway Administration apportionment that that'll be more like $15.8 million or $16 million. Um, so we've had some very recent conversations with CDOT. Um, to, to CDOT's credit um, and consistent with a January 4th Transportation Commission meeting, uh, the intent is that we will still treat um, that $36 million as if it was suballocated. Um, uh, to Dr. Cog for uh, Dr. Cog directed allocation to projects. So we're working through that process. So I think the bulk of this discussion today uh, still stands about how we'll go through the process of um, allocating these funds to projects. Uh, speaking of the Transportation Commission, I will uh, we uh, attach to the memo uh, uh, for the meeting to this evening uh, a resolution that was passed at that January 4th Commission meeting. The commission did adopt uh, projects for this for what was anticipated to be the CDOT directed COVID relief funds. Uh, they also established some goals and some requests to the uh, subrecipients like Dr. Cog for those portions. We included that. Uh, they're asking us to make our project selections uh, by April. I think we were confident we can make that time frame. It'll be a push. Uh, but we believe we can make that time frame. Uh, we're all interested in getting these dollars allocated to projects and out the door and um, on the transportation system and getting people to work as quickly as possible. So they're asking that um, uh, most of the most of the funding uh, go to projects that can go to advertisement in 2021. Um, we'll we'll 
do our best with that. There may be some projects that get selected through this process and we'll allocate specific dollars to projects that can go to add in, in 2021 and, and um, maybe some in 2022. Um, I will note further that these funds are in addition to $17 million of previously unallocated funds that we were already aware of when we were we started a waitlist protocol um, last year, kind of at the beginning of um, the pandemic, and kind of put a pause on that as we dealt with um, as we dealt with uh, COVID impacts to local project sponsors and potential delays. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Uh, most of you should be fairly familiar with our waitlist. Uh, protocol. This is adopted Dr. Cog policy that you all adopted when you adopted the 2020 through 2023 Transportation Improvement Program or TIP. Um, so our intent is um, to follow that policy, that protocol that's already in place. Um, not following that would require a policy amendment uh, through through the Board of Directors. Um, the the policy lays out the waitlist process pretty clearly. We split. Uh, available unallocated funding um, according to the regional share 20% and sub-regional share of 80% to set targets for allocating funds to the regional share and sub-regional share waiting lists. We also approach project or project sponsors for currently funded projects, give them the opportunity to advance projects from later years into earlier years. So if there are projects that are more ready to go that can take advantage of this funding earlier, um, we'll, we'll accommodate that and reprogram those projects uh, to take advantage of this, this new unanticipated money. And then we would move on to the wait list and, and bring wait list projects uh, into the funded TIP portion as well, utilizing these unallocated funds. Um, so we'll re we reach out, we work with project sponsors for all those projects in the TIP and on the waiting list, uh, work through the target amounts uh, in those areas and um, bring back an action item to the board to, to actually allocate funding to projects through a TIP amendment process. And again, we anticipate bringing that back to the board at the April meeting. Uh, finally, I do want to speak a little bit to some next steps and some and to some special circumstances uh, based on the calculations that were included in the, in the staff report to the board this evening. Uh, we are aware of one forum, Jefferson County, uh, that only has one project on its waiting list. It is um, not a priority uh, anymore for Jefferson County. They're not prepared to move forward with that project just yet uh, in that forum. It's also less than what uh, the target amount uh, for the available funds would be for Jefferson County. So we're going to be working directly with Jefferson County and CDOT uh, to work through a process to try to um, uh, come up with a recommendation from that subregion for a project to allocate uh, the available unallocated funds uh, to as part of this process. So we're going to be reaching out next steps, advance, uh, work with project sponsors to identify projects that are already in the tip that can be advanced from future years into fiscal year 21 and or 22, uh, then we'll know how much is available each, each year and can work through the waiting list process with sponsors. We'll put together that available uh, kind of universe of projects and uh, work with all the subregions to get a recommendation together uh, in time for board consider consideration at its April meeting. Um, again, uh, we, our intent is to allocate the COVID relief portion of these un unallocated funds uh, to projects that can go to add quickly, uh, even if that means perhaps reprogramming the funding type for some projects that are already programmed and already funded and already moved, already uh, uh, prepared to move forward in 2021. It's the, the same dollar amount is still available to all of the wait lists, all of the subregions. Um, so the, uh, it's just a matter of trying to get these particular dollars out the door as quickly as possible uh, to accommodate our shared interest uh, with CDOT to, to try to, to move this funding out and get it in, get it, getting, get it circulating into the economy as quickly as possible. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I'll end my summary and would be happy to entertain any questions from uh, the board. Thank you very much, Mr. Pafstorf. Uh, board members, if there's any questions, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it to you for questions. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like our first question or comment is from uh, Director Nicholas Williams. So Director Williams, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron, do we have any idea where, and 
I assume you probably would have said so, but where this extra money that CDOT's going to, to use to make this program whole, I mean, would this be safer Main Street's funding or, or any idea at this point? Uh, thank you, uh, Director, no. So what's interesting is that um, all of our estimates for the amount that would be apportioned to the state of Colorado was pretty much spot on. Uh, uh, we were estimating anywhere from 130 million to 140 million dollars. CDOT's final estimate was uh, right around 134 million dollars, and that's where the apportionment to Colorado ended up, 134 million dollars. So it doesn't change the total amount of this funding coming to the state of Colorado. Uh, the only thing that many of us missed uh, was this change just for this funding in terms of how the ratio was calculated for the sub-allocated portion to the large urban areas. Interesting, okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Director Williams. Uh, and with that, I do not see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to the chair. Thank you very much. Again, a follow-up, Mr. Papstorf. This is something that, that uh, uh, Director Flynn also brought up, similar to Director Williams. Um, so with, with the state funding sort of being spot on, uh, and um, with our, our calculation not being, uh, not being on to the sub allocations, it, is, it, is it that CDOT has a greater share of, of their state money that they are withholding and not dispersing to people like Dr. Cog, or is it going someplace else? We're just trying to find that, that, that variance, where that, where that variance is, is allocated right now if we're not getting the 35.2 million. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you very much for the clarification I, I, and, and for the question to and the opportunity to clarify. So based on our conversations with CDOT um, just this morning, um, the, the intent is that Dr. Cog will still have $36 million to allocate through the waitlist uh, process. So the commission and CDOT had already sort of done a regional um, distribution to the five CDOT regions um, of, of this funding based on the initial assessment of an estimates of how much, how much funding would be available and how much funding would be sub-allocated to the three large urban areas. So based on, even with this new information, um, CDOT's intent is to um, basically meet that meet that and still treat all those dollars that were going to come to Dr. Cog as if they're still being they're being formally suballocated to Dr. Cog. So they will still go through this waitlist process. There is we're we're still intending to go through this waitlist process and protocol and select projects for the full $53 million, including the $36 million of COVID relief funding. No, and, and I, I completely understand that I guess it, it sounds like that uh, because the state funding is the same. Uh, CDOT has allocated to the regions, but the regions are committed to working with Dr. Cog to go through our process. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to muddle the issue. It's just a uh, Director Flynn had a had a similar type thing. He just wanted to know where the VIG was from the 35.2 versus the calculation. I think. I think the answer is uh, it went to the CDOT region. So I'm just trying to answer Director Flynn's um, question that we had in the executive committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Fabs. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, yes, please. Uh, we did have an additional hand go up from uh, Rebecca White. Uh, I believe she has a question or comment regarding this. So uh, Director White. Uh, thank you. And I, I think um, uh, Chair Dyack, you summarized it well there at the end, um, but I, I just wanted to chime in from the CDOT perspective and um, thank you all for the, the discussion here tonight. You know, I, I the one piece I would add is, you know, as, as we always do, because we really work so well together as, as organizations, I think CDOT would like to have a, a voice and be part of the conversation. Um, with these these dollars, um, you know, whether that came through a direct sub allocation or a little bit of a different funding mix now. Um, but we've already started that dialogue with Ron and, and look forward to working with you all as you move through this process. Uh, thank you very much, Director White. We, uh, we also enjoy working with CDOT, um, speak on behalf of myself and the board, I'm sure. 
and uh, look forward to this um, this allocation process that we're going to do in the future. So uh, again, thank you very much, Mr. Papsdorf. Uh, with no further questions, we'll move on to the next item, item nine, briefing on the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program white paper. Mr. Cottrell, please. Mr. Cottrell, we cannot hear you. There we go. My apologies. Um, let me show my screen. All right. Can everyone see the screen? We can. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, board members, for the opportunity to present um, sort of an overview of what took place in the current cycle for 20 to 23. And as we go through, we'll present some information to you and sort of some outcomes. And we'll also kind of gear up some of the comments and questions and uh, items for discussion that we can begin this summer to kick off the, the tip cycle with the next uh, round of call for projects, which will be 24 through 27. So every tip cycle, uh, we always end up doing some sort of review after that. And then this has happened for the last 20 to 30 years. These discussions always take place with both you know, technical members, including our technical advisory committee, and also the elected officials. So we always cue in what the, what the board members felt about what worked and what maybe can be improved on um, with the last cycle that just took place. And of course, those outcomes and suggestions really guide this next, the, the next process for the next cycle that comes out. So at the end of the 2016-21 TIP cycle, um, I, I believe there was a lot of questions and concerns about how Dr. Cog was conducting this cycle, and it really kind of focused in on three main areas. Um, first being the funding equity, so how funding may have been distributed to projects throughout the region. Um, and then also the fairness of the application, um, you know, how one application can really be treated in different areas um, throughout the metro area. And of course, um, concerning local values and how local values can really, um, or how individual um, subregions or individual sponsors can really address local values within their projects um, with keeping to any of the Metro Vision and RTP um, overarching transportation objectives. Um, so this sort of kicked off a larger discussion uh, for those who remember um, and really kind of evolved into 140, 150 meetings, technical meetings and board member meetings, um, and really uh, went through its own cycle to develop sort of a new process, what we call the dual model process. Uh, so there was a couple white papers throughout that. And of course, um, at the end of this development, uh, we certainly did ask for our federal partners to weigh in because it was such a large change. Um, and one of their key, um, requests of Dr. Cog was, of course, to conduct this white paper at the end of the cycle to really get a flavor of what sort of happened and if we wish to continue this, um, the dual model process into the future. So this white paper is organized into three distinct sections. Um, just a couple of highlights here. Um, we really tried to focus on the dual model and all of those newly introduced elements so these included the forums, the new selection process, the focus areas, the application, et cetera. Um, and it really kind of summarized at the end um, sort of the analysis that we had and then lays out the future discussion topics um, going into the next cycle. We also were able to gather some technical assistance um, through a graduate student partnership. Um, his name is Kiernan Molesky. Um, and he's actually going to speak here starting on the next slide. But he was able to provide us some data collection through surveys, um, discussions, and follow up with forum members um, in interviews. And this provided a mutual benefit um, for not only himself, but for Dr. Cog. Um, and helped us produce the white paper, all the technical information, but also helped with his capstone project, kind of showing the history of previous tip cycles versus what were the outcomes of the dual model process. Um, so at this time, I'll actually turn it over to Kiernan Maleski, um, and he can kind of run through some of the uh, findings that he had. Hey, Todd, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry oh. to interrupt. Oh, there you go. Doug has it. 
No, go ahead, Melinda. Okay, uh, Todd, unfortunately, you're, I think you're showing us the wrong screen. Um, so you may want to stop sharing your screen and uh, try to go back to the page you were on. I'm so sorry. Yeah, Todd. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, you were showing the actual PowerPoint, but you weren't showing the slideshow. Oh. So, so the okay. slides weren't advancing. All right. My fault. There you go. Are we seeing now things good. now? All right. Perfect. Thanks, Sorry about Todd. that. Yep. Um, great. So as mentioned, as uh, as Todd mentioned, my name is Kiernan Maletsky, and I uh, conducted this analysis of the of the tip cycle for 2020 to 2023 for my capstone for a, a master's in public administration at CU Denver uh, completed last year. So. Todd asked me to kind of come and share some of the findings uh, of that of that process I went through with with Todd and Ron and and of course others at at Dr. Cog. So first, just um, to give you kind of a high level, what was the question being asked here? And of course, it was you know comparing the processes previous cycles to this one. And I did that in a couple of ways. We focused on the differences between the projects selected. So how did how did this process result in different immediate outcomes, which is to say projects that were selected for the tip. And then secondly, how did this process affect what we called collaborative outcomes? And that meant several different things, but most critically sort of stakeholder, that is to say you, the board, as well as technical staff from the member agencies, how did it affect those people's perception of the TIP process, as well as um, did it have any effect that we could see on overall regional collaboration, sort of spillover effects? Um, so those were the two high level things. and then. I'll, I'll get into starting on the next slide, some of the specific changes. So starting with that comparison of the project list I mentioned, um, and I know Todd alluded to this issue a little bit earlier. Um, so as you can see here, first, there wasn't really a huge change in the total project cost from the last cycle to this cycle. Um, although it's worth noting that there was so much more money available in the 2020 to 2023 cycle that in fact as a as a percentage of the overall share it did decrease so the money was i guess you could say spread a little more thinly uh in the in the most recent cycle although although not that doesn't mean that the projects were smaller the projects were about the same size so that's kind of the what we found from a dollar's perspective and then um the next on the next slide there will be um some discussion of the changes in the project types. Now, I, I want to offer a caveat to these categorizations and just note that these specific categories were slightly different in previous cycles. These are the ones that were in the 2020 to 2023 cycle. So we did some, I, I did some creative combinations and assignments of projects in previous cycles, which is one reason why if, if some of these look a little strange, like a reduction in bike pedestrian, for example, that really has more to do with kind of the way projects were categorized than than a, than a meaningful reduction. And in fact, really the takeaway from, from this analysis of the changes in project type was that, you know, there's a very similar pattern here. This suggests there wasn't a, a massive upheaval, I guess you would say, in the kinds of projects that this process resulted in in the end. So that's really the takeaway there. Um, the next analysis that was a kind of based on comparisons um, and this is, I'd, I'd say, maybe the one that's most compelling in some ways. Um, going back to 2004, you can see the way that the, the allocation has changed in terms first of total projects and as expected, um, way more projects this year than, than in some other cycles, although, although you see in 2011, a very similar number there too. Um, and then the, uh, in terms of the number of sponsoring agencies, this is where there was a real change in this cycle. Um, only one cycle in, so it's hard to know exactly what that says, but it, this certainly suggests that a much larger share of cities and counties who are members of Dr. Cog were able to submit a successful application in this most recent cycle. More than half of the total, 58% of all eligible cities and counties were awarded a a project of some kind in this most recent cycle. So that, that certainly represents a change. Um, and then next we'll talk about, I mentioned that collaborative outcomes, and this is where it gets a little squishier, a little more qualitative. And um, this, is, this is really based on a survey that was sent out to um, this group, the Dr. Cog Board of Directors, as well as the TAC and, and several other groups around this time last year. I know some of you on this call today were participants in that in that survey and we got um, pretty good response a, a little over 50 I believe 
people um, ultimately responded and um, there were a number of questions on there and we again I kind of grouped those questions by those major areas of change those major defining characteristics of the process that Todd mentioned earlier so again the high level takeaway from from what you're looking at here is um, you know the a four would mean that every single respondent said that they uh, that they felt that the question was true. All the questions were were phrased as, do you agree with this statement? And so four represents approval of, of the process. And so as you can see here, there was really a high level of approval of the of these specific aspects of the of the process sort of across the board. Uh, it's worth noting that there was a much more nuance in the open-ended responses, and that is captured a little bit in some of what Todd's going to talk about later, some of the, the finer points of, you know, things that might might improve in the future. Um, and, and I just want to highlight that determination of funding shares, the one that has the quote unquote lowest score, although note that it still is a is pretty high up there, uh, I would say is really a reflection of, of some confusion, some uncertainty around the the regional versus sub regional shares. And again, I know that's something Todd's going to get into in a minute here. Um, so that's the high level thing. Before we move on to recommendations, I also just did want to mention um, that sort of those, I mentioned that the collaborative outcomes, um, some of those more regional things, which were harder to measure, mostly because we were so early in the process. This was brand new at the time, still is brand new. And so it's a little hard to say, has this affected, you know, something as huge as regional collaboration in such a short time. Um, but anecdotally, the open-ended responses certainly suggest that there is some evidence that the sub-regional forums had that effect. And, and in conversations I've had with, with member agencies, technical staff, and things like that informally over the past year, I know those sub-regional forums have continued to be uh, uh, potentially a very promising source of, of regional collaboration, information exchange, and that kind of thing. So. With that, I'll, I'll offer some a couple of very high-level recommendations that emerged from the white paper I wrote. Uh, the first, as you might expect, would be um, that the sub-regional forums clearly are of value. Uh, they seem to improve regional collaboration in the ways that I've described. And um, further, there's no, no real evidence that, that this analysis found anyway, that the process resulted in a, a real upheaval, as I mentioned, a real change in the project types. Um, uh, grossly or, or very simplistically, I would say it's there's some suggestion that that you know these subregional forums produced a result that was as consistent with Metrovision uh, by by some measures as as previous cycles, and so that's that's an interesting finding. Um, and then that second one, um, again, a little more um, vague, but emphasizing the subregional forums' capacity for encouraging regional thinking. The intention there is really. You know, there's some questions going into this process, I know, among members about whether these sub-regional forums would cause people to uh, to lose sight of a, of, a, of a true regional focus, which, of course, is a, is a core mission of, of this whole process. And, you know, what we found anecdotally and through the um, through the, the project list comparisons is that there really isn't um, uh, any evidence of that kind of, I guess you would say, balkanization, that there really is some evidence that because this process brought more people to the table and because it created these opportunities for discussion through the subregional forums, that there is um, even some potential that, that these subregional forums can, can help the region think regionally, not just subregionally. So that was kind of the summary of the, of the white paper I, I, I worked on with, with Todd and Ron and others. And, and with that, I'll turn it back to Todd to kind of talk about what we do next year. All right, thank you, Kiernan. Uh, so next, I just wanted to kind of review some of the discussion topics and, and how those were organized within this white paper. Uh, so it's really organized into two sections, uh, the first being sort of the high-level questions and topics um, that are more policy-focused. Um, and these are really going to kick off, again, like I mentioned earlier, the discussions for the 24 to 27 um, TIP policy discussions. And of course, those discussions will not only happen with you, the Board of Directors, but also, also with our, our technical committee and the regional transportation committee. Uh, there's also a listing of other minor and technical improvements that not only staff could do to assist and, and make the process better, but also um, that we can work with, um, with TAC and our other technical members, again, to really fine tune some of the things that uh, might have gone wrong on the side, uh, but really didn't uh, affect sort of the high level policy items. And again, we'll we'll kick off these discussions um, sometime this summer, 
Uh, and of course, the items that we're going to be talking about here are really not all inclusive. There certainly may be other things that come up um, that any board member may wish to uh, have for discussion. Um, so the first is the regional share, um, and this involves the regional share intent, the definition, and the eligibility. Um, so obviously, the object of the regional share was to provide a reasonable number of projects with the greatest greatest benefit. But I think one of the discussion topics that we had going through the TIP policy development was really trying to define what that regional share was. Um, and one thing we kept hearing the entire time was, oh, you'll know it when you see it. But it was very difficult to sort of put, again, the definition and the eligibility components around what that was. So uh, again, the white paper and what you'll see on the screen here just lists out some questions that we brought up um things that um, we may want to discuss within um within our meetings um so is it possible that some of those recommendations um can be made by you know by the forums or by the committees without going through the application process um we have done this in the past and then it's happened for larger projects um so is that something that we should talk about bringing back or should the regional share process really only be be limited to a one or maybe a few projects that really help to move that um, RTP or MetroVision transportation objective. Is there some singular thing that we as Dr. Cobb can really do to help sort of push things along if possible? Um, and even going, going to the extent of should the regional share be eliminated? Is it not working as intended? Um, should we stick with just the sub-regional share process? Um, the next high-level topic was the regional and sub-regional percentage split. And again, if you recall, this is the split for 80 or 20% going for the regional share and 80% for the sub-regional share. And then again, the sub-regional share is split even further. So some of the results that we found throughout the survey, survey is that this 20, is 20 to an 80% split was adequate, uh, but certainly there are comments to change. Um, and comments to change range anywhere from a 10% going to regional, anywhere up to 50%. Um, so certainly there was no one magical number that everyone could agree upon. Of course, the 20 to 80% split is what we used for this last tip cycle. So based on sort of what we have heard throughout the entire process, we do believe that discussions are warranted to start um, sort of those discussions um, initially with the TIP policy development for the next cycle. And I, I think the most important thing to really note for this and maybe a couple of, of the other topics coming up is this really ties back into the decisions that are, are had and are made within the regional share. So for example, if we agree as Dr. Cog and within, within the policy to cut back that regional share, um, and only limit it to say maybe a few projects, that does have an effect on what that percentage split may be. Uh, the third topic is the regional share project review panel. And again, I think this is, a, this is something that's only brought up for discussion because this was a new panel. Um, this panel was used within the regional share um, selection process where to recommend projects to, to Dr. Cog for programming. Um, it was made up of um, CDOT, RTD, and members of um, the sub-regional forums. Um, and again, as I just mentioned, it does tie back to the discussions that we are going to have in the future on the regional share. Um, obviously, if there is no regional share in the future, there might not be a need to have a project review panel. Um, the fourth is the, the staff scoring of projects. Uh, so this tip cycle introduced uh, something brand new where the forums could actually score the projects themselves um, or they could have Dr. Cog score them. The, overall, I believe there was a very positive reaction, um, but it was noted that it does take staff time and certainly raises questions about objectivity. Um, so the question that we will be asking is, should we return this process um, back to Dr. Cog so Dr. Cog's staff would score all the projects? or should we keep it as, it as is, where each individual sub-regional forum is able to score their own projects. Uh, and finally, uh, focusing on TIP focus areas. Uh, if you recall in this cycle, there was three focus areas. 
Um, the first being mobility infrastructure for the vulnerable pop, pop, uh, population. Uh, the second being a focus on reliability. And the third being uh, safety and security. Um, the concept of the tip focus areas was really um, to adjust these for each cycle, um, depending on what um, Dr. Cog may be facing at that time or what the board may feel is, is an, a pressing issue at that time. So the question that we may want to ask is, should we continue using these focus areas? Um, another angle is the focus areas this time were not a eligibility component, meaning a project that submitted um, was not required to um, sort of meet any one of these three focus areas. Um, should that change for the next cycle? So again, questions for thought in future discussions. Uh, and finally, there uh, outlines um, sort of minor and technical improvements. Um, again, these are a, sort of a mixture of uh, both staff and other technical folks can have input on. Um, really, the main focus is sort of the staff interactions between forums and even the interactions from one forum to another, uh, including applications. Um, there was match, match partnerships, you know, support letters, checklists. Um, our goal is to provide sort of, um, you know, one location and certain number of forms that we can really use to support each of the forums. Um, and again, I think we can definitely strengthen that. Uh, there's also a need to, uh, and again, something we would always do each cycle is really hone in and look at the application um, to make sure that we're reviewing and eliminating things that might not be as important for this cycle versus another cycle. Um, and certainly refining it as necessary. Um, the scoring method is also something that we would want to take a look at. Um, we sort of changed the scoring method, so it looks at projects on a high, medium, and low score um, versus a previous system that was based on a 100-point scale. Uh, so certainly this is something that we would want to look at and make sure that we're still um, doing what is appropriate to score the project. Um, and again, it sort of uh, goes back to the interaction between the forums, uh, but of course, if we're going to continue to allow the forums to score their own projects, we would certainly want to provide them with the appropriate scoring sheets and a methodology to use. Uh, so with that, uh, I believe that concludes the information that I had uh, concerning the white paper. Be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Board members, are there any questions or comments? If so, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it to you for questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like our first question or comment is from uh, Director Jeff Baker. Director Baker, go ahead. Thank you, I appreciate it. And great presentation, Todd. This is wonderful news that uh, um, it's kind of like finding money in a pocket somewhere. <laughs> you kind of um, get that kind of information. But I, I do want to just say that um, um, I think the sub-regional, the allocation through the sub-regions has been working fine. And um, I think we're meeting the Metro Vision um, goals. And so I, I can't see why we would change the allocation from the 80 20 that we've been working with and it seems to be working as well as i had hoped and um so i i that's my uh, thoughts on that appreciate hearing anybody else's thoughts all right thank you director baker our next question or comment is from uh director stephanie walton director walton go ahead Uh, it looks like you're muted. You just need to unmute yourself on your end. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, and I appreciate that um, you know Dr. Cog involved a, a student and uh, provided an opportunity for a capstone project. So congratulations on that, and uh, and good luck on your future. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. I have an observation and a question. Um, the observation is that it does not seem like the additional staff time that it took in the in and all of the meetings at a sub-region level um, really was a deal breaker for con continuing um, the the pro the tip 
program as we have done it this last cycle. Um, but I am interested in understanding a little bit more about um, or or would would request that there be some consideration for those communities who are smaller and whose staff is maybe a little more lean and mean so that um, members can begin to anticipate and staff appropriately for the future for the next cycle. Um, and um, and then I'll just take this opportunity to thank Boulder County staff for doing the heavy lifting for our Boulder County subregion on behalf of Lafayette. Although in the meantime, we do have a transportation planner and we do have a transportation uh, plan that we're working on um, in time for the next um, round. So hopefully we will be in, in a different position, um, you know, from a particular um, Lafayette point of view and uh, as it relates to the impacts, you know, um, and opportunities on our regional level. Um, I, uh, so I guess more, that was really maybe more of an observation as well, but, um, but, the, but I guess my question related to that is yeah. when the next cycle um, would begin, um, just so I kind of had that on my radar um, as it pertains to when we'll be completing our plan. And then, um, Another, and then my other question relates to um, any kind of federal feedback that we um, would be seeking. Um, if I recall correctly, these were in my early days as being a board member, but if I recall correctly, there was sort of an agreement or observations that um, that we were, um, you know, maybe launching something that the um, the federal partners were going to be interested to see, and I just wondered what um, if there's, you know, kind of what the communication loop is there, um, or um, if we just forge ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, no, thank you for the question. So um, maybe I can provide just a very brief schedule on for the for the tip cycle for 24 to 27. Um, essentially. Starting this summer, we'll kick off these TIP policy discussions um, right around maybe late spring to summer of 22. We'll be conducting um, the calls for projects, assumably the regional and the sub-regional. Um, and we'll be looking for that TIP adoption coming up in April of 2023. Um, in terms of federal feedback, um, honestly, I, I, we typically don't hear a lot of feedback, and I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, typically, um, from what we understand, um, our federal partners are usually pretty silent unless we are doing something that is um, not correct. I guess that's maybe a good way to say that. Um, but I, I think in general, they've been supportive without really um, saying too much. Thank you. There, there you go. Thank you, Director Walton. Okay, our next question or comment is from uh, Director Larry Vidim. Director Vidim, go ahead. Uh, you just need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just uh, compliment uh, you, Mr. Cottrell, for an outstanding presentation. Um, the other, the other, the other comments that I had were, uh, it was my impression that the dual model of having both a, a regional and a sub, sub regional category was extremely well received in the last cycle. And, and, and next I thought the, the uh, process of having each sub region uh, rate or score their own projects was also very, very successful. And so as we uh, consider going forward, I hope uh, those features will remain in the next cycle. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Director Vidim. Okay, and at this time, I do not see any other hands raised, so I will hand it back to our chair. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Mr. Cottrell, a couple of uh, questions from the chair. Um, uh, Director Walton, I think, was, was talking about uh, time. Um, and to me, it, it seemed from the outside looking in that, that there was sort of a fair amount of time 
from Dr. Cox's staff to kind of get all of the um, all of the processes in place. If we go through another uh, cycle, dual model cycle, when we do, um, how much of a time savings uh, is Dr. Cog's staff going to realize because all of those processes are have been put in place? Um, my guess would be, if I remember correctly, when we were initially set up the forum, that yeah. first six months was really dealing with sort of the ins and outs and the development and sort of setting the foundation. Um, so we could probably certainly save approximately six months there. Um, and certainly just a few pieces of time here and there that are really dealing with um, more of the explanation. So that will certainly happen again. Uh, but I think there is time that we can certainly save because we've been through this process before. And um, in, in terms of this white paper, next steps, I mean, is, is TAC going to uh, review and uh, discuss this or, or use this as a tool for your policy recommendations to the board? So TAC has seen this white paper, and as we get a little bit later in this year, um, we will certainly use all of our committees appropriately to really um, kick off some of these some of these discussions. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Cottrell and Mr. Oletsky. I appreciate your uh, your time and your interest and uh, continued success. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much. And we will move yeah. on on our agenda. Um, agenda item 10, update on regional climate action planning. Mr. Calverts, please. Thank you, Chair Dyack. Uh, uh, for those that don't know me, I am Brad Calvert. I am the director of the Regional Planning and Development Division uh, here at Dr. Cog. Uh, you're actually going to primarily hear from uh, uh, Angie Fife, uh, Executive Director of the USA, uh, on this item. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Angie here in a second. Uh, but I did want to briefly uh, orient the board and, and our guests to a couple of attachments uh, related to this item. Uh, that are in the packet that, that Angie is not really covering directly, but we'll, but we did want to include those for you this evening. So I figured I'd give you some orientation of those. Um, as noted in the memo, uh, over the past 15 um, months or so, ICLEI has been working with a dedicated group of uh, local and regional stakeholders to produce a regional greenhouse gas inventory uh, for the Denver region. Um, on January 12th, uh, Dr. Cog convened uh, a MetroVision idea exchange uh, on regional climate action planning. Uh, if you're interested in even uh, a deeper dive, you can find a recording of that webinar uh, on the Dr. Cog website. You're going to hear a pretty similar briefing uh, to what Angie shared during the idea exchange uh, tonight. Uh, that's attachment one, um, but the idea exchange also featured several uh, local governments that are pursuing innovative climate and sustainability focused uh, initiatives. Um, related to the idea exchange, uh, like many organizations, Dr. Cog has transitioned uh, to basically an all virtual uh, set of uh, idea exchanges. And with that change, uh, we focused our attention on how to best engage participants and promote dialogue uh, during what can often be and feel like a one-sided conversation from panelists uh, to audience. So for the idea exchange last week, uh, each of the four speakers uh, actually asked the audience questions uh, rather than um, really relying on the traditional Q&A uh, format where, where, the, where the audience is asking questions of the panelists. Uh, for that, we used uh, the Mentimeter tool, um, which is sort of an online interactive polling tool that we've, we've used at a few board meetings uh, as well to gather information uh, from the audience and to be able to share those that information back uh, with the panelists as well as everyone in the audience. Uh, so that's really kind of what attachments two and three are uh, for this agenda item. You'll see those in, the, in your packet. Uh, those are really polling results uh, uh, that are the results of uh, the 70 or so uh, participants from last week's idea exchange, about 22 or so uh, local governments participated. Uh, we asked kind of a series of questions, but they are very specifically about uh, two very specific questions that we uh, asked the audience. Uh, how can regional climate action benefit local communities? And then what climate actions should the region work on together? Uh, so since this feedback is very recent and timely uh, related to this presentation uh, and reflects both local and regional uh, contributions to climate action, we thought it was important to share that 
uh, with you this evening as well, in addition to what uh, Angie will share uh, during her presentation. So that was kind of the quick orientation I wanted to do very specifically on, the, on those two attachments if they were provided uh, for your uh, in your information this evening. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Angie. Um, Angie Fife is uh, Executive Director of ICLE USA uh, and a member of ICLE's uh, Global Senior Management Team. Uh, prior to joining ICLE, uh, uh, Angie served in various roles supporting community sustainability and resilience, uh, including leadership positions with the Governor's Energy Office and the Colorado Chapter of the U.S. Uh, Green Building Council. So it looks as though Angie is set up uh, to present by our crack team uh, at Dr. Cox. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Angie. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, thank you, directors, for your time this evening. Um, Brad, am I broadcasting okay? You can see my screen. Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks again for your time this evening. I will go briefly through the protocol, the accounting protocol that was used to create the greenhouse gas inventory, uh, the results of the inventory, a comparison to the state's inventory and a relationship to the state's greenhouse gas roadmap, which was announced just last week as well and then um, provide a little bit of a high level overview of business as usual forecasting should the region continue to grow at the rate um, that it is currently. So the inventory overview, the accounting method is the US community protocol for community scale greenhouse gas emissions. We essentially have drawn a boundary around Dr. Cog using your geographic boundary, and we're counting the activity that is happening within the boundary. We used 35 different data sources from utilities, uh, different waste haulers, and of course, a number of the data points in this inventory come directly from Dr. Cog and the transportation team. We look at scope one, two, and three emissions, which simply means um, any fossil fuels that are being combusted within the geographic boundary. Uh, grid tied electricity, so electricity that is generated outside of Dr. Cog's boundary but is used within our boundary for lighting and cooling, and then some aviation emissions um, that are uh, occurring through transboundary transportation in and out of Denver International Airport um, in particular. We recognize too that the, this uh, overview of emissions, um, which is the standard by which local governments account for their emissions, is not a consumption-based inventory. We recognize that there are a number of, of uh, emissions that are occurring outside of our boundary in terms of industrial processes, um, uh, the distribution of goods and services um, coming in and out of our community. Um, these are not accounted for in this particular scope, only the activity happening here within our boundary. So a high level overview of the emissions results, about 40%, 39% of the emissions in the Dr. Cog region are a result of transportation and mobile sources. Those would be snowblowers and, and lawnmowers and those types of things. 19% um, uh, in residential energy consumption, 25% in commercial building energy consumption for a total of about 44%. Um, so that is the bulk of the emissions that are happening within our boundaries. We then asked ourselves, how does this compare to the state's inventory? And we had to do a, a little bit of modeling and some assumptions because the, the uh, inventory year that the state used was a different year um, than the year that we had used to estimate emissions within the region. And so we did some, some factoring based on um, what we were seeing in changes in emissions. But the significant findings, I think, for this um, presentation this evening are to highlight two things. Um, here in the region, we are 56% uh, roughly of the state's population, but we make up 64% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions um, related to transportation. So on a per capita basis, um, here in the region, we have a little bit higher footprint um, than our neighbors outside of the region in transportation. Um, contrast that with our electric power sector because so much of our electricity comes from Excel Energy, which has been mandated since 2004 to move to renewable energy at a greater degree. Um, we, on a per capita share, are a little bit lower than our neighbors on uh, emissions related to the electric power sector. The importance and the, the benefits of a regional approach 
Um, we know that there are a number of local governments in the region who have been working for quite some time on their climate action plans and many local governments within the region that have not had the opportunity to do that, um, perhaps because of a lack of capacity, small staff um, and whatnot. But we see benefits for both large and advanced um, local governments as well as just starting learning communities, smaller communities. The, the larger communities have an opportunity to work together um, collaboratively on issues that are definitely regional in scale. So it's difficult for one community, any one community to really move the needle on transportation emissions, for example, because we have a regional uh, approach to our transportation system. Likewise, for smaller local governments, for so smaller municipalities, um, there's no need for them to reinvent the wheel. We can take what works in Wheat Ridge and we can replicate it in Thornton and so on. We looked then at the regional forecasts, trying to forecast out to mid-century. Um, you may recall from the state's greenhouse gas roadmap from uh, the Climate Action Bill that was passed in the 2019 legislation, uh, that the goals for the state are to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030 and 90% by 2050 from a 2005 baseline. And so we started to ask ourselves, what would happen if we took no action within the region and the region continued to grow at the rate it is projected to grow? And so we came up with a business as usual um, forecast, the, the bottom graph here on the left, which of course um, will not give us uh, the reductions that the state is aiming for at a statewide level. And then a worst case scenario being uh, if current policy that is in place for some reason is not um, realized if, if Excel Energy, for example, is unable to meet its renewable portfolio standard. Um, we made some assumptions about what sort of um, emissions we might see in the region in that case. We also looked at the regional forecast versus the state forecast and um, looked at some opportunities to um, align the approaches there as we start to work with both our state partners and our local partners um, to continue to act here in the region. And I think, Brad, I'll just leave these last couple of slides. Um, as Brad mentioned, these are some of the, um, the answers to questions that we as panelists threw out to the Metro Ideas Exchange participants at the, um, the exchange on the 12th. They were really great. Um, questions and, and input that was provided by the local governments. We really do need uh, the individual municipalities and counties to weigh in on what region, what local policies um, are they interested in working on and um, what regional policies are you all interested in working on together. Um, we've done some of the analysis, we've, we've collected the data, um, it's now uh, up to the municipalities and counties to come together and help to identify the types of strategies um, that you all would like to work together on um, to meet these ambitious goals. Thank you, Brad. I'll hand it back to you. And with that, I'll hand it back to the chair to uh, walk us through any questions that the board might have. Uh, thank you very much. Executive Director Rex, uh, you have a, a question or a comment? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I do have a question. First, I'd like to thank Angie for being here tonight. Uh, uh, it was very informative. I saw a similar presentation at the Regional Air Quality Council um, late in 2020, and I thought it was informative and, and wanted to share it with the board. Um, and Angie, I'm glad Angie mentioned uh, 1261 and the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Roadmap, and, and the board will recall that we had uh, Director Will Tor um, come and present to the board um, in the latter half of uh, 2020 as well, related to the to the roadmap. And um, you know, this conversation is um, is going to increase in its frequency, probably simply because of the roadmap. And I um, just so everybody understands, the uh, it, um, House Bill 1261 that was passed back in 2019. Um, it uh, it sets some fairly aggressive targets with regards to greenhouse gas reduction and and you'll recall uh, Director Will Tor uh, talking about that. Um, and there will there is a number of upcoming rulemakings that will be occurring um, in 2021. Transportation is probably going to be up in the summer time period. And uh, so we want to make sure that we have a voice in those conversations. So I thought it was important that the board 
get an understanding of where our inventory is related to, um, you know, to the state. And uh, so, because we, you know, I think we want to be in a, in a position where we're, uh, we're recommending or providing some options with regards to mitigation strategies, as opposed to being dictated as exactly what we might have to do in this region. So basically we want, you know, if you're not at, not at the table, you're on the menu, that type of thing, right? So we wanted to make sure that the, the board is aware of, um, of all the information that's out there so we can make some, some uh, um, appropriate decisions from, from a board perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. Uh, board members, if you have questions or comments, please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it over to you for questions and comments. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give the directors just a moment to get hands raised. Okay, and as I'm going through the list, I do not see any hands raised at this time. Well. well it must have been a very complete um, a complete presentation. Thank you very much to both uh, for Thank your you. time and, and words. Appreciate it. Um, moving on, uh, item 11, committee reports. We have a report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Vice Chair Stolzman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the agenda item that uh, Director Papstorf gave earlier was the main content of the State Transportation Advisory Committee um, discussion. And it actually, the presentation tonight had new and late breaking news that was even different from our two stack meetings this month. But I do want to let everyone know about another update we got around a grant program, two different grant programs. And so get your pens out um, so you can apply for these different grants from CDOT. So there are grant programs under the Can Do Colorado grant program. One of them is called Revitalizing Main Streets, and they still have funding available for that program, and communities can get up to $50,000 if they apply, and it's for innovation around uh, maybe reprogramming um, streets for bike and pedestrian access, trying to do innovative things around sidewalk dining and seating, um, crosswalk improvement, wayfinding, those kinds of things. So make sure you let your staff know there's still funding available for that program and that you can get up to $50,000 for that. The other program they wanted to tell us about at Stack is a program called uh, Community Telework Challenge Grants. And those had originally been $5,000 grants, but CDOT just increased the uh, max amount up to 10,000. So they are smaller grants but they are for communities to apply for to encourage um, TDM, transportation demand management and teleworking. But they, um, the program manager, Molly Bly was talking and she said that things like fiber optic projects and community Wi-Fi and things like that would qualify. So make sure your IT directors know because I know a lot of us have had to put in infrastructure to help the kids with remote schooling and other types of telework um, where people are using our parks and public spaces in ways they hadn't been before. So be sure you apply. And the other thing I just want to make sure everyone knows on the telework challenge is that a community can apply for more than one project. And those are going to be open until they run out of funding. So we want to be sure that we make every community in our region eligible and apply if they would like to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is that all, Vice Chair Stolzman? We may have a, a technical glitch, but I will assume that um, Vice Chair Stolzman is done with her report. If not, we will revisit her after. Um, that, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Thank you, Vice Chair Stolzman. Uh, the next report, report of the Metro Mayor's Caucus. I received word from Director Atchison that the Metro Mayor's is scheduled to meet tomorrow, so there is no report tonight. Uh, with that, we will move on to the report of the Metro Area County Commissioners. Uh, Director Baker, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Metro Area County Commissioners will be meeting on Friday for our first meeting of 2021. Adams County will be hosting the meetings this year. Uh, we'll be meeting every month. Uh, if anyone is interested in attending, you can contact Adam Berg the Legislative and Government Affairs Senior Advisor with Adams County, or let me know and I'll make sure you get the information.
All right. Um, with that, thank you very much, Director Baker. Um, the next item, report from the Advisory Committee on Aging. Ms. Sanchez Warren. Hi, everyone. Um, our meeting was all about COVID vaccine. We had a presentation from Heather Roth, who's the Chief of Immunization for the state of Colorado. She provided a wonderful um, presentation on the state's um, immunize, or vaccination plan, sorry, um, for, and we focused a lot on the 70 plus uh, population. And we also had Jared Hughes, who is the new senior policy advisor, advisor for the governor. And he kind of introduced himself and gave an update on vaccines from the governor's office. Um, we talked a lot about how the AAA network, meaning all AAAs in the state and their contracted partners could, uh, are a logical partner for this effort. Um, we can help identify, reach and transport the hard to serve older adult population, um, those that are homebound, that don't drive, that lack technology, that don't speak English. Um, and we can help decision makers uh, in health systems as well as the state be successful in vaccinating the older adults who want them. That's my report. Right. Thank you very much, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Uh, the next item, report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We did not meet in January. Our first meeting of 2021 is going to be on February 5th. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Next item, report from the E-470 authority. That would be the chair. Um, we had a couple items. One was to, uh, to consider a project request from Adams County Open Space to tie the E-470 High Plains Trail that goes along the entire E-470 corridor to their Riverdale Bluffs open space to provide a better trail user experience. Uh, the board was very favorable with this request. It also, I believe, accelerates the uh, timeline to get that connectivity to, uh, to the north from the E-470 existing trail. Um, in addition, we, we did uh, our board officer nominations and yours truly is the vice chair of the E-470 board. And with that, that ends my report. Um, the next item, report from CDOT, Director Wright, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, you know, most of, of what I would have covered uh, has been uh, already discussed this evening from the, the content uh, Ron Papsdorf walked through to the uh, mention of the grant programs from Director Stoltzman. Uh, so I will leave it at that tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Wright. Uh, the next and last item, report on Fast Tracks, Director Van Meter. Thank you, Chair. Um, the board's planning capital programs and fast tracks committee did not meet in February, but I do have some um, general updates about RTD. First, the board held a meeting on January 5th to install their newly elected board members and elect officers for 2021. Also, last week, RTD was notified by the Federal Transit Administration of the apportionment of approximately $203 million in funds to the district through the CRRSAA, or I'm told it's being referred to as CRISA Act of 2021. And as was the case with the Coronavirus CARES Act that was signed into law last March, this supplemental funding requires no local match and can be used for expenditures from January 1st, 2021 forward. The funds are to be used as soon as possible and are expended on a reimbursement basis, and they can be used for any operations costs associated with COVID-19, including staffing. And on that note, the week before, RTD took the difficult action of reducing its workforce by about 300 employees due to the economic challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, as a result of the new CRISA funds, RTD will be able to and is working to rescind some of the layoffs, which were planned to better align our workforce to current service and ridership levels. More information will be forthcoming as we work through the process in the coming days and weeks. Finally, 
directors will recall that we put Reimagine RTD on hold in August 2020. We're in the process of restarting that project now, planning to re-engage the consultant team soon and the project's committees, stakeholders, and the public in the March 2021 timeframe. That concludes my updates. Thank you very much, Director Van Meter. Uh, with that, we will go to the next section uh, of the agenda, informational items. As Executive Director Rex indicated, there, there are a, a lot of items which should be of interest to, to board members. Please feel free to review those at your leisure. Uh, the next and last section of the agenda, administrative items. Uh, our next meeting is February 17th, 2021. And with that, uh, the next item, other matters by members. If any of the members have other matters to discuss or to comment on, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on the phone. Ms. Stevens, is there anyone who has any other matters to discuss? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just giving everyone a moment to get hands raised just in case. All right, at this time, I am not seeing any hands raised. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, with no, no other matters by members, I will adjourn the meeting at 821. Thank you, everyone. See you next month. Good night. Thank you, Good Mr. Night. Chair. Good night. Good night. Good night.